गुजराती लोग खूब प्रभाव पड़ता हो दरक क्षेत्र में ये ज्यां जाए त्याँ नाम रोशन करता हो गुजरात डंको चौक्स वगाड़ता हो एक क्षेत्र बाकी नहीं कि ज्या आज गुजराती पहुँची न शक्य होने सफलता सोपान सर्व न कर सक्य हो तेरे विषय बात है कि ग्लोबली ए दुनियाभर में गुजराती प्रभाव के पड़ी रो गुजराती शू शू कर सक्या है शू शू कर क्षमता धरा रहा है आज आप मुद्दे आ पेनल साथ बातचीत करवाई है अपनी साथ जोड़े मार ग्रुप फाउंडर एवं आशीष भाई ठक्कर अपनी साथ यूके में हाउस ऑफ लॉर्ड्स लेबर पार्टी सभ्य लॉर्ड पीखो पारेक अपनी साथ है ऑस्ट्रेलियन साइंटिस्ट डॉक्टर धार्मिका मिस्त्री अपनी साथ है आप तमाम स्वागत है आ चर्चा में सहयोग आपसे मरा सहयोगी खूब जाता पत्रकार एवं अजय भाई उमट तो अपनी ताड़ी साथ आ सेशन की शुरुआत करिए सौ पेला भेगो भाई आपने पूछवा खूब पीड आप अनुभव अपनी उम्र पर तेरे एक गुजराती तरीके त्या बैठा बैठा गुजरात केव लगे के इन्फ्लुअंस हो सके गुजराती क्षेत्र में गुजराती <laughs> and the question we have had some discussions in the morning i think one or two were mistaken in their fact in their facts others are different and what i thought i would do is to give you a sketch of what has happened to our people during the last 140 years that we have been traveling <coughs> indians were taken as indentured laborers in 18 throughout the 18th century but certainly until 1836 when that was stopped after that slavery was abolished for all these reasons we needed an extra pool of labor and they found that not in the japanese they recruited japanese but they suffered from very very they tried portuguese and they finally settled on indians and this is very striking historically what did they think of us in order for a group to say these guys can come as indentured laborers which means five year contract they come we give them land they can till it and then at the end of five years either they go back or they stay on why did they think of what did they think of us to be worthy of being indentured laborers but anyway as a result of that kind of movement then movement to the states kuwait and all those places we are about 25 million people all over the world we are in uh, can you hear me yeah thoduk na ji ka we are 25 million people roughly we are settled in 28 can we are settled in about 44 countries but mainly in 28 in no country are we in a majority except one which is mauritius and in different countries there is a dip, we have followed different histories different patterns some years ago i was invited to address a conference on the indian diaspora which was chaired by atal bihari vajpayee and i thought i'll write it all out so i wrote out my speech and i was reading it just before coming here and i was struck by the fact that in, which i mentioned in that lecture that indians settled in 44 countries significantly in 23 what was their history like where did they come from what gods and goddesses did they take what gods and goddesses did they drop what is the area of life to which an immigrant always wants to cling to look at yourself and look at myself after two generations three generations what is common between you and your grand great great grandchildren and the surprising thing is we thought there were four possibilities dress 
is one possibility. Second is love of music. You like to hear music and then continues in generations. The other is food. And we discovered that food was the constant. Your children and grandchildren, once they are accustomed to it, would love Indian food. You don't have to worry about it. Although that doesn't make them Indian, but, uh, but that at least initiates them into Indian culture. In terms of politics, some of these countries produce Indians, Gujaratis, as senior politicians. South Africa was, the, was one, of the great, one of the finest countries which produced first-class Indian political leaders who went to jail with Nelson Mandela and other things. This hasn't happened in almost any other country. If you look at Malaysia, if you look at Sri Lanka, if you look at uh, uh, Pakistan or West Indies, you don't find Indians in prominent positions. They always want to do business quietly, send their children to private education, and hope that that will give them a platform to take off. That has been the thesis. With the result, that if you look at our people, that constant tendency to make money, but not money for its own sake, as they would do here. Money in order to pass it on to the children, and then give them as a starter. So for all these reasons, uh, our people lost some gods. I can give you examples of which gods we lost in, the, in Trinidad, which is a fascinating country. If you look at Trinidad, Tobacco, uh, and Jamaica, we lost various gods, but we restored some others, like Kali. Kali became a very popular goddess in Jamaica. It was also very striking that Indian male, especially a Hindu male, was always afraid of a black colleague. Why? Why was a Hindu young man of this young man's age, 25, 26, always afraid of a black man? And that's because he thought that the black man was going to steal his woman. That was one of the deepest fears our people had, that the black man, more formal, more charming, more ecstatic, more romantic, more romantic would take away our wife and leave us alone. So that kind of fear we always had. Even now, in some countries, that fear remains. So then, uh, if you look at the history of the West, if you take different countries, you get different patterns. I don't want to talk about the states, because most of you know it. Don't want to talk about England. I know it quite well, but you also know something about England. I want to talk about those parts of the world which we tend to forget and which haunt us. And when we talk about immigrants, we forget that we created a second class of citizens, the untouchables, if you like, whom then we sent abroad and been care for them carefully. Take the West Indies. West Indies, our people were recruited and sent to work as indentured laborers. Now, naturally, you can't have men alone. You must have women. So the British say there'll be five women, five women for 20 men. Just think for a second. What does it take somebody to think like this, that we will allow five women for 20 men, which they did, and what was the result? The result was that a woman can fool around with all of them, it also meant that she became manipulative. She became the stronger party because she knew that she was stronger than the male. The result of that was the entire family values got topsy-turvy in the West Indies. Not the values of India, where wife can be, you know, the husband is patriarch, the wife obeys and all that kind of thing. In the West Indies, the total transformation and family values became quite different to what we think now. With the result that in 1870 and 1880, the government of the West Indies began to worry about the decline of the family. So brought in strict rules. If a woman was found fooling around, she is in jail. If a man was doing this kind of thing, he is in jail. Strict rules with the result that since 1940-50, 
value structure has changed. And if you have a West Indian friend, and if you talk to him, you'll get the feeling of what I'm saying. So that's broadly about uh, what happened to the West Indies. South Africa, the story was quite different. It's the only part of the world where we were politically active, like Yadu and Mahatma Gandhi and others. Yeah. Uh, Jamaica, again, we were active. In Malaysia, we were active. But in other countries, we simply remained passive. What was the consequence of that? And that is beautifully put by a man called Mohandas Gandhi. He put it beautifully because in South Africa, he was fighting against the unjust laws which require Indian marriages to be registered. So people who go from here to South Africa, husband and wife, the government said, you must register your marriages. And Indians say, this is unacceptable. You know, you can ask your slave to do this. We are married, but my passport says this. Nothing more than that. But no, the government insisted. Gandhi led a protest. He expected a lot of people to follow him. They didn't. Because many of them were doing a quiet deal with the officers. They were giving money and getting a register. Gandhi realized that his people, his people as he called them, were not going to stand by him and fight with him. With the result that he made a remark which I want you to remember. Have yeah. I gone on too long? Just one minute. Yeah. So he what did, we can do? Let me just finish this remark. Yeah, yeah. At which point Gandhi got unbelievably angry for the first time in his life. And he said, when shall we learn to rebel against ourselves? ourselves? Just look at the sentence. When shall we learn to rebel against ourselves? Apne wa mati jeva chie, eni samay, awa prakut prakuti samay. Uwa rewa ni shakti kem nathi apne ma. And then he went further, the next sentence. If you behave like a worm, if you behave like a worm, don't blame others for trampling on you. Very well said. Kira tarike tamare jivu ho to samu maana tamavar pagma kuan ho. Maan tamaru se ke tamay pyaan na tempt karo. गुजराती विदेश विरोध कर सत्य लड़ी सके गुजराती Every bank you go to are our people. Uh, business, trade. Blacks were working on the farms, which our people owned. That happens with Gujaratis. Very good. Many Gujaratis. Any, 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 any Lakshmanik town in Gujarat? You need to talk about. Ashish, boy, you have asked that. Jerry, you have your own group. You are the founders of our group. Now, business opportunity. Can you tell us how did and how did you all develop this? Um, good afternoon. Thank you so much. Um, firstly, I'd like to thank uh, Sunil, Sunil Bai and Profil Bai Naik, um, Sue Smith and the team at Ayana, also Barun Das and the team at TV9 for this phenomenal setup. And really, I'd like to salute your passion for holding this, really the, the promotion of Gujaratis globally. and bringing that uh, as sunil bai said you know removing the coconut nuts of all of us i think it's a it's a brilliant thing and i've been personally quite lucky because um my spiritual leader morari bapu has with his teaching of satya prem and karuna has kept me very connected with gujarat and india he's made me uh, very very proud to be a gujarati and to be an indian um and obviously um 
getting married to Krishna, my wife, who's in the crowd, has, has made me even more so proud to be Gujarati, who's from Gujarat. But Amar family, 1890, we left huh. Gujarat and we went to East Africa. So when you think about, you know, my, my ancestors traveling yeah. purely for entrepreneurial opportunities, it's quite amazing. I'll interrupt you for a moment. Bhikkhu Bhai, his story is, you know, from Rex to riches. But interestingly, I thought that seldom you will find, you know, okay, dropouts who will become the richest person in the world. For example, Bill Gates or Steve Jobs. Here is a story that he is a dropout and still he has become one of the richest men. So that is the, I think, very inspirational story that we want to hear from you because time yes, yes. is a constraint. But that is the most interesting story that we want to hear from you. Okay, from a refugee, you have become the richest man. Tell us that story. Huh? Yes, yes. Sure. So basically, I mean, you know, my family went through the 1972 Idi Amin saga in Uganda and got wiped out, uh, moved to England, started again. And then in 1993, we moved to Rwanda. Nine months later, unfortunately, the genocide broke out. So my parents, my sister and I were refugees during the genocide for 35 of the 100 days. Luckily came out okay, but unfortunately lost everything again. So we started from scratch and I, I quit school when I was 15 years old, took a $5,000 loan and set up the business about 25, 26 years ago. Um, over this journey, over 26 years, we've created 16 different businesses in 26 uh, African countries created 30,000 jobs in the process. But I think more importantly, I think, you know, wealth creation is definitely important. But alongside that, I think creating a positive social impact is equally important. And this is why I chair the United Nations Global Entrepreneurship Council and very focused on how we really make sure in line with the sustainable development goals of the United Nations that we leave no one behind in a true manner. And I think, you know, and, and Bapu teaches us this as well, but positivity attracts positivity. You do good and you will do well. If you give back, you will get back tenfold. So it's a matter of how you combine and it's the best way to create a sustainable and self-sustainable and a scalable business in the real sense. So I think, I think Africa is a phenomenal place for business and Gujarati is uh, to, to, to um, Lord uh, to point is that, you know, Gujaratis have really penetrated a lot of these African countries. I mean, we have, it's great to see an ambassador uh, of Uganda to the United Kingdom who's a Gujarati who's here as well. And it's, it's proud that we've got this kind of thing and we've been able to spread, but we don't forget our roots, which is the key thing. And thanks to events like this even more so. So I would say, you know, the biggest thing is Africa, people talk about the challenges, people talk about corruption, people talk about difficult you know, 54 different countries, but in my opinion, frankly, there are only going to be takers if there are givers. Private sector, <laughs> oh, sorry. No, that's not a problem. <laughs> the, today is 15th October. Oh, yes. Today is 15th October and uh, incidentally that she is one of the finest researcher based out of Australia and her area of expertise is in breast cancer and today the whole world is celebrating breast cancer awareness day. That's so we are lucky that you know on this day we have such a good scientist available to us. Thank you. So, Dharmika, I just wanted to know because, you know, during lunch session and afterwards we were discussing the, in India we have started, uh, you know, early detection and uh, breast cancer awareness activities and we find that every year the incidence of almost one lakh more cases are added. So, I just want, and Indian scientists could not find out the reason, what is the reason or cause of this breast cancer. Some people, there are certain myths that, you know, if you consume more oral contraceptives or infertility treatment or you know if you don't have children or if there is no breastfeeding then that may cause you know this breast cancer so as an expert i want to understand from you that what is the reason because there are a lot of 
miss. So what is reality? And another thing that what is the protocol in Australia? For example, in India, after 30 years, you start, you know, sonography, then mammography every second year. And after 50 years, every year you should uh, undergo mammography and other things. So what is the protocol for early detection and uh, creating awareness in the society in nutshell? Sure. And I just want to say thank you as well for having me here today. Uh, I would start with the first part, which is, you know, what causes cancer? That's a very heavy question, Bai. Um, cancer, we still really don't know the root cause, but we know a few things about the way that it behaves. So we know that it is, it can happen at any time for lots of different people. It can be triggered by different things in environment or lifestyle, but we can't pinpoint and say... Maybe stress also. Yes, that's exactly right. So it's a holistic piece, right? It's your mental health, it's your physical health, it's your environmental health. And I think at the end of the day, we have to go back to the core of our human bodies, which is our immune system, right? So balancing your immune system means living a really holistic, clean life, I, you know, like doing things that are good for you and bring out the best in you. And so that's what I think we should look at when we think about cancer. It's not necessarily, we don't know enough to know what it's always triggered by, especially with breast cancer. You can have women who have um, lumps in their breast, but they'll die of a heart attack. It doesn't, you know, dictate how one might pass away. The important thing with cancer, because we don't know what it is, is we must detect it early. And so that's why when we go out there and we're promoting women to go out and get tested early, the main reason is because we can't fight it unless we detect it early. And so there are lots of reasons why that doesn't happen in different cultures, but also in Australia we start testing women from the age of 40 with the current, gold, what they call the gold standard, which is mammography. It can't be used for women under the age of 40 because of breast density. So it doesn't work as well in younger women. And therefore, we only start screening from the age of 40 unless you have a family history. So women under the age of 40 have one tool. That tool is this. It is your hand. And if you can detect it with that, then that's what, that's what we get. So that's why I was motivated to develop something else. And sure, it was a bit of an accident how I came about it. but. Um, the reason to keep on trying to develop it was very strong. Thank you Thank so you. much. We know that in the Rajkiya Kshetra, in the medical Kshetra, in the Udyog Jagat, in the Kshetra, 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 in the Kshetra,